Right, while we're just preparing, um, can I get you to, um, this is intended to be practical, uh, this. So if you haven't done all row it ready, can you clone the Git, uh, can you clone the GCC repository? Okay, I'll do a bit, I'm gonna do a bit of a talk so you will have time to clone it um, while there. Um, and we, we're on time. So I'm Jeremy Bennett from Embercosm. Um, uh, and I've been involved with GCC for years and years, uh, but I'm more of a GDB simulator debug interface uh, person rather than a GCC person. But I'm all, I am a compiler guy originally, so, um, uh, and I've always felt I wanted to get into GCC, and the way to get into any subject is to teach it to someone else. But I should give credit where it's due. This is not my talk originally. This was done by Maxim Blinov, who some of you may have met at previous conferences. And I've taken it and developed it. And it is still not finished. Okay. So this is, um, this is yes, practical. I want you to do it. But I want you to do it because I want you to fix the things that I haven't got working yet. Um, so hopefully over the next two hours, we'll get some way towards that. Can I just check, how many peer here people here actually already are familiar with GCC and done GCC development? Okay, so you guys are gonna be really helpful when I get stuck, and the rest of you then are beginners. Can I also ask, how many people came along to the tutorial I did at Cambridge last year? Oh, that's very good, because I'm gonna do a refresher, so you're gonna be the only person who might say, I've seen these slides before. Okay, so what I'm going to do is, um, I'm going to, I've actually got two talks, one of which is a refreshed talk from last year, which I'm going to go through quite quickly, which is the, the theoretical basis underpinning compilers. And the theory matters because when it gets all hard and difficult, just understanding where it all sits is helpful. Um, the talk is about how you add a new target to GCC, so it's, all, it, it's fundamentally a back-end talk. So I will go quite quickly through the theory of the front-end, just so you know it's there and you, you, can, you, you can cover it in due course, okay? So first part then, the theory bit, okay? And there is a bit of overlap with the second, so, so some of this I'll go through quickly because I'm going to go through it more when we get to the practical, okay? So, come on, you can do it. Yes, just mainline GCC, yeah. So, if, yeah, if you just clone mainline GCC, um, and later on it'll get... Uh, uh, so, this talk was given last year uh, in Cambridge, and it was dovetailed with David Malcolm's uh, talk, which was on the middle end. Um, and what, what we want to start is that this is theory, but it's not, a, you, it's not an academic sort of thing. It's designed is to allow you to relate the theory to GCC. Okay, so we'll look at where you can find more information. So after this talk, you can go away and find more information. We'll look at the structure of a compiler, what the key data structures. We'll look at how optimization works. Okay, and there's a, a bit of an example there we'll look about fixing. And, um, and actually, this is starting to get into the second talk, because fixing the example is now my second talk. We'll take a short break in between. And right at the end of this talk, yes, you'll know the theory, but you'll know how to get started with the GCC back end. So you, whether it's a Cray one or whatever, you can start putting it on there. And I want feedback, because the idea is to develop this so eventually it becomes a general course for people who want to get into GCC, want to make it easier for people to join this community. Okay. Um, so a bit of background reading. Uh, I say I've, I was a I was an academic for nearly a decade, and I wrote a textbook, and this is designed to be a short textbook. It is now out of print, and you can get it on Amazon for as little as one penny. Um, it is it is readily available secondhand, um, so um, that's there and. It's quite old, um, I wrote it in 1990, but the core techniques in there are useful, and the has if being short. 
this book, I can't remember who recommended me, someone in the GCC community said this is a really good book for people going to GCC. I've not actually read it myself, but can you remember who recommended it, David? Yeah, okay, so that's, that's a modern one that's recommended. And then there's the Bible, okay? Um, and uh, you can have the first or second edition. The second edition requires you to be extremely wealthy. Um, um, and this is known as the Dragon Book. It is incidentally why LLVM has as its logo a dragon. Um, so the first version is absolutely fine. It, the only critical thing it admits is it predates static single assignment, which is important. And then the, the new edition where Monica Lamb is added to the authors is good. But um, yes, the, annoyingly, there is a cheap international edition, which is much cheaper, but it doesn't have a dragon on the front. And what's the point of a dragon book without a dragon on the front? So, OK. Um, uh, but the other one, and this is going to be your Bible, is the GCC internals manual. And that is a. Yeah, it's maintained over here. I mean, it's got variability of all internal documentation, but compared to most projects, it's a very good internals document. Okay, and I will keep on linking to sections of that through this talk. So let's go through fairly. I'm going to do this fairly quickly. So this is the structure of compiler. You're starting with a source language. You've got to analyze it. You've got to break it down from just strings of characters into meaningful things. Is this a for or a while, or is it a number or a variable? OK, and then you've got to put those together to say, well, a for and a variable and an assignment and a start and an end. That start at a body, that's a for loop. So that's that's syntax analysis. OK, and what's permitted in the in the in the individual tokens and in into the whole language is described by a formal grammar. OK, and then you've got to work out what it means. And that's semantic analysis. And that's everything from, you know, how things might um, uh, you know what this is a loop and this is the start and this then through to things like the types of things and, 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 and type inference okay and once you've come out of that you want to you want to represent it into forms that are easy to manipulate and optimize and those are called intermediate languages and we'll look at those in a bit more and you can optimize that intermediate language you can generate code from it for your actual target and you can then optimize that target code potentially. And of course, you're going to bolt in a runtime system to get something you can execute. And the point of splitting that intermediate language is one, it, well, it helps with some of the optimizations you can do, but also means that if you want, if you've got a new language, you've only got to do the front half, the bit on the left, and now you can do all the targets, which is why, for example, GCC Rust project, just a new front end on the left. And on the back, if you, if you develop a, for a new target, so um, your new chip that's come out, which is what we're looking at today, then you should be able to support all the languages at the front end. So you've done your back end, and you should be able to support Fortran, G, C, C++, Modular 2, um, Rust, and so forth. Okay? So it, it, it turns a, a potential M by N problem of all the languages and all the back ends into a, at least an, a, an order N problem. Um, in terms of GCC, GCC has a number of inter intermediate languages that look more generic, Jimple, and RTL. And they, different intermediate languages have different advantages. They're open to different optimizations. How to define a language? Back us now a form. Um, basically, you say something on the left can be expanded to something on the right. OK, so for an example, an assignment, data can exp uh, an assignment statement can expand as a variable, a colon, equal symbol, an expression. OK, and basically a grammar that defines a language is just a whole set of pattern matches like this. And at one time, you have one symbol, if you like, is at the top you start from, your starting symbol. So typically in your grammar, you'll have program is and then what a program is. Okay, and that will be your sentence symbol. Okay, you may have multiple definitions of a symbol. So A can be B1, B2, 3 to BN, or A could be replaced by C1, C2, CN. And you can just use a vertical bar to separate those. They can be recursive. So A can be an A followed by an X or a Y. And that defines a whole language consists of strings of Y, YX, YXX, YXXX, and so forth. 
And there's this empty production which says A can be nothing at all, epsilon. Okay. And how to define a language. So what you end up with, non-terminal symbols, they're the things that, can appear, that appear on the left of the productions. They can be on the right as well. Okay? Terminal symbols, the, the things you actually type at the computer, they only ever appear on the right side of the platform. They can never be expanded any further. So when you get to a terminal symbol, there is no more expansion. And then a grammar is just the four things of the sentence symbol, where I start, which has got to be a non-terminal. You've got to be able to expand it to something. P, the set of productions, those rules for I can replace this by this. N, the set of non-terminal symbols. T, the set of terminal symbols. That's what defines a language. It defines Fortran, it defines C, it defines C++. Okay? And a sentence is a string of symbols in the terminal set derived from the sentence symbol. Okay? So I've gone from the definition of a program down something. Okay? So that's a sentence, what we might call a valid program in a programming language. And a language of a grammar is the set of sentences derived um, uh, using G. Now, if this was a university course, we'd go on for this for about three weeks because it makes for fabulous exam questions. But most of you will never write a front end. Rust GCC is one of the, you know, how, how often do we add a new language to GCC? Once every five years? Yes, well, yeah, yeah, yes. So a lot of this is, yeah, you need to know it so you understand when the tools go wrong, but mostly this is automated. Um, and if you look at your grammar, so I've got a grammar on the left here, S goes to A, B, A goes to A, X, Y, and then B. So basically, that's all the symbols that are Y, any number of Xs, and then Z. Okay, and so if I've got an example y, x, x, z, I can sort of represent how all the rules have been used in a tree, and that's called a parse tree. And we will come across parse trees. Okay. Just to note here, when we try and write these grammars, an ambiguous grammar is when there's more than one way of um, uh, doing things. So if you look here, um, expression is an exp here's a grammar. Expre an expression is an expression, a binary operator, an expression, or it's an integer. So if I give you 1 plus 2 plus 3, is that make a 1 plus 2 and then add on a 3? Or is it make a 2 plus 3 and then add on the 1? There's two different ways you could expand those rules to do that. It's an ambiguous grammar. And you can disambiguate rules. So if you've done mathematics, you know, bod mass, brackets. Oh, I can't remember. Oh, yes. Addition and subtraction. Okay, so you can put those rules in the grammar. And the reason for that is when you're building a compiler, you want a consistent way of expanding your grammar. And all grammars are, for real programming languages, defined in such a way that you can work out what this structure is automatically. Um, so parsing theory, basically, that's just about saying, given a program, how do we work out how it was structured? What are the rules that were applied? So we can say here, um, here's my grammar. So when I've got my um, sentence YZ, I got that by going expanding S to AB, A to Y, B to Z, um, which gives my, my, my YZ. But I could have done B and A the other way around. Okay? And all they are about whether you've expanded the sentence, you've built up, if you think from the bottom, you've put your terminals together up to the non-terminal from the left or from the right. Okay? That's going to matter because when we come to a compiler, actually, as we get these work out what things are, we're going to try and generate code from them. We're going to try and build a bars tree and so forth. And actually knowing what order we're going to get things as we work out what a program structure is, is going to matter. Okay, but that's all. I'm not going to really go into more of that because we're not going to really worry about front ends. This is more interesting. Inter uh, intermediate representations. This is the here's another example of parse tray. So this is the factorial function, which is func um, so um, it's a main function with no arguments that calls a factorial function. How do I represent that structure in the program? Okay, and uh, I can represent it as a tree showing the various rules we've used. Okay. Um, this is what we're going to spend most time, three address code, okay? So which is going to a bit more detail. I've recognized my language and I've now spat it out in actually into a series of operations. Three address code, two arguments with an operator that gives me a result, 
Okay, so I've got an expression a times b plus a times b in tackers. I could do it as temporary a times b temporary. Then c is t1 plus t2. Okay, and three address code. We'll come back to that more because we're going to do a lot of that today. And obviously, it's binary operators, but you can do unary operators by ignoring one argument. You can assign, you can do assignment by ignoring the operator and one argument. You can do an unconditional jump where you ignore all the arguments and you've got the result is the label of attack instruction. You can do conditional, conditional jumps where you've got a conditional and the result is actually where you want to jump to. And you can do call and return where one argument is the address and one is the, is, is the result is the return value. Okay, so let's look at where GCC comes. So GCC has three intermediate representations. We start with generic which is actually a tree representation. It's generically called tree within GCC. And that's a tree uh, level representation of the program you've recognized. And there are some middle end transformations that work really well on trees, okay? And Gimple derives from that and it's really a flattened tree. Okay, so it's still in the mindset of tree. It's a good place to do vectorization and loop unrolling. And then where we're going to worry about is down the bottom as you get to low level three address code. An RTL, register transfer language, is GCC's three address code. You will see it looks a lot more complicated than the simple three address code I showed, but that's what we're going to see. Okay. So abstract, it's sort of like an abstract assembly language. It's got register of memory references, it's got arithmetic operations, it can move data around, it can do control flow. And confusingly, it's used in two places. What I've been talking about so forth, far is as an intermediate representation. Okay? Um, it's written syntactically in a Lisp-like structure in scheme, but it's fair. So it's used as an intermediate representation, and we'll see there are flags to GCC. You can get it to print out its intermediate representation as it compiles. Okay? But it's also used, and there's where we're going to the second half of this talk, in machine description files. So we also use this register transfer language in machine description files to describe an architecture to GCC. Okay. So here we are. You can take a little program, uh, compile it, GCC minus F dump RTL expand, and actually that's generating assembly. If you put minus DP, it'll actually annotate it into the assembler. Okay. And is it? So if you want to just take a couple of minutes, you've got GCC on your machines. Write yourself a tiny little program and just uh, run that, and you should get a whole load of. Um, well, if you put the minus DP on the end there, then you'll get your .s file with the RTL inside it. anyone actually gets that working, do let me know. Yep, good. Anyone getting stuck? No one's stuck? You got it working okay? Okay, right. Okay, so that's the very start. And more generically, there's lots of flags. You can do a verbosism, that's another way of doing it. You've got dump tree all. That will dump out the tree representation. Okay, and actually what you'll see is it gets dumped into files because the way GCC works is it takes this intermediate representation and improves it. And then another optimization improves it further and improves it further, improves it further. So actually when you do this, you will find you get hundreds of files as it dumps out what this intermediate representation looks like after each optimization stage. And you can jump out the tree level, you can jump out IPA, which I think jumps, jumps out the generic passes, and you can dump the RTL. Okay? 
actually maybe a correction. Mm. I think that Adam Tree Oil actually dumps also Gimple. Uh, Dust, dust in Gimple as well, does it? Yes. Okay, so this, this will give you generic and Gimple. Okay, what does IPA give you? Uh, it's, IPA is also Gimple, but uh, the interprocedural passes. Okay, so it's just the, okay, right, so it's sort of thinking about the different phases you're on rather than the actual representation, okay. So, okay. Okay, okay, right, so, right. Yep. Right, okay, so you will get your files numbered for all the passes, but watch out for the interprocedural ones, because then they don't have the right sort of numbers in the sequence. Okay, good catch. Right, Matt? Yeah, bigger numbers, yeah, later. Okay, and so, yeah, look at the numbers to give you a guide, but beware of the trap. And I will be looking at this video afterwards to update the slides with comments like that, okay? So, yeah, key on feeding, we're going to get So here's an example of RTL as an intermediate instruction. Um, represented in, can I just, how many people have done LISP or Scheme? A little bit, okay. So it has lots of brackets. Um, it basically is a prefix notation of function, argument, 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 okay. So um, these look like LISP functions um, and... You, well, once you get as intermediate are going to be either a note or an instant. The note is just informative. It's not semantically useful. But as you go from pass, it's quite useful to know I've gone from one pass to the next and have a note that an instant's been deleted. And um, the instant is the substantive things. And you first of all start with a set of numbers, and I will have to remind myself which order they come in. First is the unique ID. Then there's the previous RTL instruction, then there's the next RTL instruction. So, um, in some five, the previous was one, which was the note, next is two, and you'll see two, the previous was five, the next is three, which we're not showing here. And then the last number is the basic block uh, to which you belong. Can I just check, is everyone here familiar with the concept of a basic block? Anyone not know what a basic block is? Good, okay, right, so. Um, and then after that, you got an RTL expression, okay, that tells you something here. And in this case, we're storing a register uh, with register number five uh, of single integer size to a location in memory referenced by a long pointer. Uh, and with the addition of an index register number 82 with the constant minus four, which can hold a single integer. Don't worry about that for now, because we're going to come back to that in the practical side. Okay, but it's telling you an awful lot about exactly what you're trying to do. Um, RTL modes, GCC modes, these are the type systems. So you can think of these as RTL types. And um, uh, QI, QI, some remind me, what's the capitalization significance? I thought there was a significance. Anyway, so uppercase or lowercase, you go everything from quarter integer, which is eight bits, up to DF double float, which is 64 bits, and TI tetra integer, which is 128 bits. And when you have these, I'm not sure how we deal with unusual types. I think you were, are you talking about tune when you have these 120 bit floating point that IBM have? TF. There's a TF. So there is a TF mode as well for tetra uh, float. Okay. And you've got U or U unsigned variant of the above where applicable. Okay. So further reading. The RTL section of the internals manual. That will explain everything about RTL and the machine modes section of the internals manual. And in the side, the source code, do have a look at them now. You've got macmode.def, which will be, um, uh, and macmode.h, which will uh, 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 be there. Okay. So that's the GCC subdirectory of the GCC repository. So, okay. Types that look or sort of work in terms of the, the 
use the source code and the time saver. Yep. Yeah. 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 Yeah, so yes, that's a good point. So Dave makes a point which I'll repeat for the recording, which is when you're at Gimple and when you're at tree level, you've got user types that relate to your original program. It's when you get to RTL, you go down to these very raw, how many bits is it? Is it an integer? Is it a float? Is it signed? Is it unsigned? Yes. That, that's interesting. Does anyone here want to, because we've done, uh, there's all sorts of things. There are TV cameras that have 10-bit integers and things like that. So, um, yeah, the answer is, I think probably you deal with them by mapping them to the next biggest size, and then you're going to have to put stuff in to mask out bits or control what goes on. Actually, have you worked on any of these funny? Vax is fairly straightforward, isn't it? Yeah, but we have, um, unfortunately, Craig Blackmore's not in here because I think he's worked on some of the funny size ones. I think from memory, you you choose the next biggest size and then you're going to have to jump through all sorts of hoops to control the size. But it's quite common to have 24-bit addresses and, and how do you deal with that? And certainly in the specialist DSPs, funny sizes. And if you go back far enough, the, uh, the Apollo guidance computer had 15-bit words. Um, so, um, so I'm going to go through this very quickly. Syntax analysis. I really want to just make... Oh, yeah, sure, yeah, go ahead. So RTL is already uh, describing the representation for a specific architecture based on what word size it might use. No, it's abstract at this stage. You don't know so, what... So but when you... Just an yes, yes. So, so, the, the, Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, so we go. Yeah, so but David makes the point that he's quite right. Is RTL starts out as completely abstract. By the time you get to where you're doing code generation, yes, it's still using the abstract types, but they're terribly geared to what you're going to need to actually generate code from them. So it may be where you're representing a thirty. You know, a 32-bit integer, but the actual code generation step will realize I can only use 20 bits of that because it's a 20-bit integer on your machine. Okay, and we'll look at how the code generation because the, the second half of this is all about how you do that. Okay, but good question. Keep on asking the questions, incidentally, they're really useful, and I will repeat them for the benefit of the recording. Syntax. I'm not going to go into big data there. So here, I just want to make a point here is that, and this is all automated. Here's just an expression. Anyone variable called any one multiplied by 496. And you can see how the parse tree, just for that tiny thing, is massive, because I'm doing it letter by letter, digit by digit. And actually, what we do is we split things up and say, that's not terribly helpful. And we represent it like this, where we say, look, it's just a variable. OK? I don't need to show you that the variable is made of this letter, this letter, letter. Let's just associate a variable with it. Oh, right, thank you very much. Where you see plus there, imagine it's an asterisk symbol. I did this last night, and I, I got muddled, okay, yeah. So, you know, I haven't turned a Steiner. It, it, that's purely typographical error. Thank you very much. And the point is that it's a much more compact graph. It seems to have gone into a plus everywhere, but what was originally a star? Okay, so what we do is we separately worry about the low level, breaking things up into... It's the difference between trying, trying to understand a book a letter at a time and saying, no, the book is made out of words and let's just deal with the words, OK? So, and the reason we do that, separate that out, is one, is it clearer to understand? Secondly, the grammar for things like the variable or a number or a symbol is incredibly simple and you can actually recognise that very, very fast. And actually, one of the key factors in, in compiling is just how fast you can analyze the actual textual code. So if you, anything you can do fast in that is going to be a win. OK? And it's got a particular sort of grammar. I'm not going to go into this. It's a very simple grammar called a type 3 grammar, finite grammar. 
because they can be recognized by finite state machines. And you can handwrite them, you can handwrite a state machine, or you can use tools like Flex to generate for them. I think I'm right, GCC has a handwritten scanner? Well, the C, the C++ for contents are now handwritten. Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, okay. How to write a parser? They're mostly what are called type two grammars. I'm not going to go into this. You can. These are Noam Chomsky definitions. The point is that the, they're structured in a way that, to be efficient, you can always tell by just looking one symbol ahead in the stream what you're. Go, well, always with some caveats, pretty much always tell by looking at one symbol ahead what I've got in my hand and you don't have to keep on backtracking and say, well, what did I read earlier? Because that makes things slower. Um, you can handwrite them with recursive descent. You can do table-driven automated ones with tools like Andler. You can do table-driven bottom-up using Bison. Um, and GCC C++ has a handwritten recursive descent parser with extensions to deal with the grammar. If you're interested, there's a link in there. Look up the most vexing parse on Wikipedia because it breaks all these rules to make things efficient. Um, so code generation, and this is where we're going to get most interested for this talk. Okay, and I say this is the theory. You generate the intermediate representation during parsing, and you're going to, as we talked about earlier, get from that down to your actual physical code. Okay, You've got to worry about things like how to allocate storage. Static and global variables can go in a fixed area, dynamic data on the stack. You're going to use registers, because registers are typically fast compared to memory. And you can associate a variable in memory with a register while you're working on it, and then only put it out to memory when you're there. A and you have register descriptors tell you what's in the register. You've got address descriptors to say which registers are slaving a location in memory. And uh, so we should be, I'm not sure what the modern term is. We don't call them slaves anymore. But you write out these register um, slaves when you need to. Ideally, you keep everything in a register because it's super fast. But at some stage, you're going to have to push it out into memory. In GCC, code generation is made generic. So GCC is a pattern matching compiler. Okay? You all sort of write patterns of saying, if you see intermediate code like this, you can replace it by this. And that's how it works. And all the wonders of GCC are actually the algorithms that are used to make that pattern matching down. And for those of you who are interested, it's exactly the same thing that you use in Prolog for doing the resolution in Prolog. Um, okay. And Basically, you match some standard patterns in RTL and give a template of how they are to be generated, and that's the machine description. We'll go into that more. And a big part of optimization is pattern replacement. I've got this pattern of RTL. I can make it by replace it by this pattern, which is more efficient. Okay. Um, so lower and Gimple to RTL. So basically, you come out of Gimple, and when you go to that most abstract thing, it gets turned into a set of standard patterns. Add QI, so add two, so it's three arguments, that's the three. Add two quarter integer eight bit values and give another one. Okay, sub DI3, subtract two double integer values, mal SI3, multiply two single integer uh, values. And what we have to do is we then actually have to provide patterns that say, once we've got these, how do you handle them? Now, you could turn them into other RTL, but probably we're going to first of all focus on how would you turn them into assembly code for your target, OK? And many of them can be ignored, OK? Atomics, vector ops, OK? Um, because actually they're there to make code generation more efficient, but if you can't do it, the compiler will use something simpler instead, OK? So machine descriptions written in a scheme-like language, so um, uh, Lisp, it's using the concept of RTL expressions and machine modes and syntax. It's done at compile time. It's parsed at compile time. So it's when, and what I mean, I mean, as in the GCC, when you build GCC, all this machine description will get turned into C and be linked into the compiler. So it runs, so say C++, thank you, Mr. C++ in the corner. Yeah, these days, it used to be turned into C. These days, it's turned into C++. And that C++ becomes part of the compiler. Okay, so you're not interpreting scheme whenever you run uh, GCC. Um, 
and invoked when it when it's run. Okay. Um, I'm not going to go into this here because I'm going to do it in the next one. But here, basically, you've got the basic idea: define instruction. So this is one of the standard ones. Add SI3, and we've got some RTL that describes what it matches, what it's looking for in the RTL, and um, we've got some syntax with some patterns to substitute for assembly code to generate. This is taken from Risk Five, um, and we've got some attributes we set. Okay. And I'm going to skip through this because this does appear in the second talk. Okay. Okay. So further reading on machine descriptions, um, the standard machine. Uh, so in the internals manual, there's a list inside the description of RTL of all the standard names that you can generate. I say what we don't have, and I've asked around. I don't think anyone believes it is what the minimal set you have to implement to get a working compiler, because you certainly have to, don't have to implement some of the obscure vector um, patterns if all you're doing is an integer microcontroller. Um, um, so, um, and, um, so the machine description section, there's a whole lot on machine description. And within there, there's particularly an output statement section, which we'll come back to, which is about what's the format, the templated format of assembly you're generating. We'll come back to that later. So we've got the machine mode definition, list of standard RTL pattern names, and an example, RISC-5. Okay. Uh, right, I just want to take you something. This is just to show you where we're going with optimization. This is the theory of optimization, and I'm going to do it in terms of simple three address code, just to show you the base, so basic blocks. So we all know what this is. Flow of control comes in at the beginning, leaves at the end, but otherwise is linear through. You can't get into the middle of this. Okay? May receive control from multiple places, may leave to multiple places, but it's the ideal unit for local optimization because it is entirely linear. You've got a very good idea of what happens one after the other. Okay? Um, and you, you can put all your basic blocks for a whole program together into a control flow graph. So. One block, I17, S equals naught, and then a label which you're going, because you've probably got a loop here, here's the loop you're going round, and then an end block, and blocks can be empty, of course. Okay. Um, live and dead variables, this is going to be ubiquitous, this is a really important concept throughout. Okay, so consider you've got a three address code, A becomes B op C, okay, um, and the statement references B and C. B and C have got to be available to it because it uses them. Okay? And um, what we can say from that is we have this definition. A live name is any name variable that has its name value referenced later on in the block. So up until here, B and C were live because they must be, because they're used here anywhere, they will be live because I better keep them around because I'm going to use them in this operation here. Okay? And if you're not live, you're dead. Okay? Yeah, that's very binary. Um, and what we need to know is, in order to work out this liveness, we need to know where a name's next referenced. All the way earlier, we need to know B and C are going to be referenced here. Okay? So, what happens at the end of the basic block? Okay? So the only live names at the end of the basic block are names referenced in other basic blocks. And that's going to need data flow analysis, and we will touch on that. I'm not going to go into data flow analysis in detail. It's too, too complex. Okay? But a simple assumption is to say, we're going to have a mixture of user-defined names, the variables from your program, and temporary variables we've used for intermediate. And as a simple assumption, just assume all user-defined names are live and all temporary names are dead okay? at the end of the basic block. Okay, so let's have a look at a local optimization example. And this is a little contrived, but here we have a total of eight uh, three address code statements which do some arithmetic. Okay, and you can see it's, it, it's, it's a reason I have instructions. Let's see how you can optimize this. Well, the first is a technique called common sub expression elimination. You see here in two places we compute T3 times T1. And actually, T3 and T1 haven't been changed in between. They're exactly the same computation. So why do I do the second computation? I'll just assign there. So I'm going to replace T6. I can just use the previous computation. It's just a simple assignment. Okay. Okay, so that's made it a bit simpler. 
Then we've got copy propagation, okay? Where we've got T6 between T4. Well, we could just use T4 here because why, why just, it's just a copy. So let's just put T4 there. Now, why do we do all this? Well, we can do it again. Common subway, we've got T... Now we've, this happens, but we've got T4 plus T5. We can do the same common sub-expression elimination. Don't compute it twice. And we can do copy propagation again. Okay, now... This is why we do all this. Those themselves, yeah, they've simplified it a bit. They've made it a bit easier. But this is the why, what you do. Because now we see we've got these two copies, T6, T32. Oh, well, no one actually uses these. We can get rid of them. And dead code elimination. And what you find is lots of these local optimizations, they, they simplify, they change things, and they lead copy propagation and tends to lead to dead code. And dead code can then be eliminated. Okay, so we can do dead code elimination. We can do constant folding. Okay, we can pre-compute 4 minus 2. There are some technical issues around this that you need to make sure you do the computation the same way it'll be done on the target. So you've got an expression there and you just need to make sure the arithmetic semantics are absolutely identical to your target. So if you've got a compiler running on a 64-bit machine and you're compiling for an 8-bit Arduino, just have a little think. The type system in GCC will help you get that right because the type system actually is abstract, okay? Okay, so we can do constant folding, so that becomes two. And then we can do copy propagation. So there we are, and then that gives us another, um, uh, um, uh, we, now we realize T1, because T1's dead actually, we can get rid of it, okay? So um, dead code elimination, more constant folding, okay, more copy propagation, and dead code elimination again, okay? Then we get algebraic identities. A times one is A, okay? So we can just replace by that. Oh, now we've got a copy. We can copy propagate it away. We can get rid of the dead code. Um, and so we're down to that, okay? Um, and the one last thing we can do is we can do algebraic on many machines, not all machines. Multiplication is more expensive than addition, so it makes sense to replace multiplication by addition, okay? And that's the complete optimization. So you see, we've gone from eight instructions down to just three. And it just, yes. Potentially, yes. Yeah, you could do a left shift by one. Yeah, there's, 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 there's yeah, exactly so. Um, there's, there's a number of possibilities there. Um, and there we, we see how that optimization has turned eight, eight statements into three. You saw you've only got two temporaries instead of seven. Um, you've got rid of some subtractions and divisions, and you've only got one multiplication left uh, now. Okay. Now it is a contrived example from a textbook just to show what's possible, but it's what you end up doing, and you also don't do it in hundreds of passes, one after the other. Other these are basically you can optimize those algorithms to make it all happen at once, so you can you know, basically do everything all in one go, but it's useful to break it out, okay? If you want to do global optimizations, and I'm not going to cover it here, how do we find loops? Okay, so we can optimize loops. How do we get better liveness optimized information? Because we just assumed A, B, and C were live at the end of that block. But what happens if one of them isn't used at all? Maybe we can get rid of some of that, okay? Um, and if we could get full information at the start and end of basic blocks, then we could do much better. And that requires global data flow analysis. Um, and basically, where we had next reference, where is this variable next referenced in this basic block? That's replaced by the idea of reaching definitions. Where does it reach throughout the whole program? Um, uh, copy statements, again, you're looking now to copy propagate across blocks. Which copy statements stay unchanged across basic blocks? Available expressions. Um, this is about enabling common sub-expression elimination across blocks. And live variables, of course, we can compute this exactly with data flow analysis. Um, again, I'm not going to... Data flow analysis is quite complicated. But basically what we try and do is we compute sets of definitions, instructions of definitions generated in a particular statement, set of definitions killed in a particular statement. You can build up all this data, okay? And you can compute sets for the entire block. Okay, And you do it by data flow equations, which sort of say, well, 
if I've got this set of data and this is the next instruction, here's how I update my set. And you go through and create these sets. So there are, it's not in my book. It, my book doesn't, well, my book sort of does slightly touch on it. But the real good description of that is in Aho, Sethi, and Ullman. Okay. Static single assignment. You notice how I use temporary variables. Okay. Um, and we use a large number of temporary variables. Actually, what became apparent about 30 years, 20, 30 years ago is um, temporary variables typically go in registers, and maybe we need to spill in memory if we run out of registers. But it turns out it's best if we only ever assign a temporary variable once. Okay? And every time you want another temporary variable, don't re use one you've had, just allocate another one, which is what I was doing in that example there. Okay? And it makes optimization much easier. When you do your data flow ana analysis, your use definition chains with temporaries are all one, uh, are all, all of length one. So a lot of the optimization from them. The only problem you have is when you get, um, uh, um, imagine you've got an if-then-else block, and you've got a computation that could be done in if and then, and then you want to combine the two. And you've got two temporaries to unify into one. And that gets awfully hard just to have one variable. And there's a trick called, if you're American, fee nodes. If you're British, phi nodes um, as a trick to get control. I say, just look up fee nodes, and that will tell you. And it's called static single assignment. At this stage, I just want you to be aware, if you use a Sethi, and Ullman, you will have to have the second edition, because static single assignment was invented after the first edition. OK? Um, but it's not a terribly difficult concept. It's just making rigorous something we mostly did, and with the, the addition of the fee node, actually to make branching consistent with that, which is fee nodes are sort of a, an intellectual trick to think about how you do things. They don't actually do really. They're, they're, Yeah, yes. By the time you get to RTL, you've just got all your register out and it's all sorted out. But as I just repeat for the microphone, um, there's 200 optimizations of Gimple that go on inside GCC using this stuff. Okay, um, And it's amazing how the stuff you learn about data flow analysis gets so much easier when all your USDEF chains are just one long. And global re register allocation. So this is you have an infinite number of registers. We're going to an infinite number of temporaries. We want to assign them all to registers, but I've only got 16, 32, maybe 64 registers available to me. How do I do that? And what I've got to do is try and do a mapping, because actually, if I get it wrong and I have to, oh, I need another register, I've got to put this register in memory so I can free up a register to use, that is inefficient, what's called register spilling. Okay. There is a systematic solution called register colouring, okay, from Gregor Chaitin of IBM Research in upstate New York. I mean, I'm, pres I'm assuming he must be long retired now. Um, and what you do is you represent all your temporaries in a graph. And any temporaries that are both live at the same time clearly can't share a register. You connect them with a line, okay? And you colour the nodes, um, um, you, you colour the nodes with different colours. And all you say is that nodes of the same colour must not be connected. Okay? And the number of colours you're trying to use is the same as the number of registers you've got available. If you can do a colouring, then basically you can assign a registers according to the colour of the node and it all's right. If you can't, then you've got to introduce some spill code to break up your graph. Now, this is a brilliant idea. The only problem is it's an MP complete problem, MP hard problem actually. So actually doing it for any decent sized program fully is not computationally a problem. So we use heuristics to solve it. And there are other algorithms to do it. Actually, if you, ever, if you go and look at the small device C compiler, which is a tiny C compiler aimed at really small machines, 6502 and so forth, it does actually do full, it does do full register coloring because it's only ever doing tiny little programs. OK. Right. OK. So um, that's the theory bit, and I wanted to put that there just so you understand the framework in which the practical stuff we're going to do next is fitting. Okay. 
So I say it's distilled from our graduate training course. It's about 15 hours of lectures um, uh, given over three weeks full time. OK. Um, oh, I've left out that line. So there isn't a Dave Malcolm tutorial because this was from last year. So um, yeah, it would give some context to last year's tutorial from Dave. Um, and there were questions, should we have more talks like this and go to Dave? Okay, right. So some of this I haven't updated from last year. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Right. Um, okay. So that's the theory basis. Um, I'm proposing, let's just take a five minute break. Let's fling the windows open and get some air in. Let's stretch our legs, do your arm exercises and so forth. And it's, it's eight minutes to, we'll reconvene at three minutes to. So just have a five minute break, stretch your legs. Okay, so this is now going firmly in the practical stuff. Okay. Um, and what I'm aiming for is at the end of this, you've got an idea how to create a back end. Okay. Depending on how fast we go, I've got some useful feedback from the first talk. Do send me emails about the talk would be better if, because the idea is to keep refining this so it can become tutorial material we can generically use. So this is about um, uh, the command. And here are all the bits that make up a GNU toolchain. We're only going to worry today about GCC. We're not going to worry about the assembler, the libraries, the bin utils, and so forth. Um, so how to get GCC up and running, and at the end, you'll know where to get started. Okay. Um, sources of information, yes, we've covered these before, we've covered these before, and the, G the internals manual. And here you can see, I've actually got the sections on here. So you see the one about RTL representation, machine descriptions, and so forth. Okay. Um, we're going to use a theoretical new chip. Um, it's got a load of byte addressed memory, it's got 16 general purpose registers plus a program counter and a status flag. It's got an ALU that does all the usual arithmetic and logical stuff. It hasn't got any floating point. And it's got index store and, um, uh, and a load address, which is a uh, uh, and register register moves. We've got branches. Um, we've got unconditional branches. We've got branch and link for doing jumps. And um, there's a quick summary of status flags. So when you do arithmetic, I mean, this looks very 68,000 like Z if it, the result is zero or a low zero, N if it's negative, C if you've got si uh, unsigned overflowed, V if it's signed overflow. Okay, where do we get started? You do this, but that's why I asked you to do it earlier because it takes time. So you've got um, you know, GCC. So if we look at the top level directory, so my I've checked out my thing called GCC, and inside the first thing is there's another directory called GCC. Okay, and the reason for this is 30 years ago, GCC, bin utils, GDB were all the same one monster um, uh, repository. Obviously, it predates Git, and so there was GCC directory, there was a bin utils directory, there was a GDB directory, and so forth. So that's why GCC then has a GCC directory within it. Within that config directory, and that's where the configuration for different backends in. So you'll see one for RISC-5, you'll see one for AVR, you'll see one for I386. Um, and a directory with various libraries used by GCC, um, for example, the standard C++ library and the GCC support library, the emulation library. Okay. Let's have a look inside GCC config RISC-5. RISC-5.h, target specific definitions, uh, what register available, byte, bit endiness, and the like. RISC-5.c, target specific algorithms to do particular things that aren't generically in GCC. The big one, RISC-5.md, the machine description for RISC-5. And RISC-5.opt, where you specify all the target specific flags and options for GCC when you've got the minus, you know, what MARCH does for RISC-5 or the the thing that tell you about the um, memory models you could use. RISC five is interesting because it's sort of modern and interesting. It is quite complicated. I wouldn't get too hung up on RISC five. Yes. So it's RISC five CC. Oh. Yeah. Uh, CC. Is it CC now? Okay, right. Okay, so CC. Thank you very much. So RISC five dot CC. Okay. Um, I'm slightly showing how long I've been working with GCC. So when I say C, 
I may mean C++ in various places. First thing, let's do configuring GCC for your new chip. OK, um, config.sub, that's generic across all GNU projects, and it has a repository of its own. If you're going to upstream this, you need to, first thing you need to do is submit a pull request to uh, config.sub or send a patch for config.sub saying, here's the patch to support my architecture. Okay, and it will automatically then copy, get copied into the GCC hierarchy. For now, we'll just do it at the top level for um, uh, GCC. So if you want to take your GCC.sub at the top level of your repo and um, just give it its canonical um, CPU type. So uh, look for where it says recognize that, go through and above VAX, you can put VAM, our new machine. Okay. So I'll let you guys do that. So this is at the top level of the repository. Any problems or questions asked? So, um, the next thing is we need to look at config.gcc. Now, this is within the GCC, no, this is specific to GCC, config.gcc. And that's GCC specific configuration data. And where you can specify any particular files, and it'll automatically assume target.cc, H, M, D, and org. So I need to update that to be CC. OK. Um, but for VAM, there's a bit of what environment I was sitting in. So TM file is the list of all the files you care about, and we're going to extend it by adding LFOS, the bare metal header, on, on front of it. OK? So if you want to change edit config.cc, add a VAM star hyphen elf, the bare metal VAM, um, uh, above the VAX Linux, OK? And add TML. TM file equals LFOS dollar TM file. Okay. Yes. So I didn't hear the question. Yeah, opt. Yes. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. That way it says org. It should be opt. Oh. Yeah. I will fix the slides. Okay. So dot c. So it assumes dot cc dot h dot md and dot opt. So if you could look for VAX, look where you've got TM files discovered for VAX star Linux, and then, and we have the VAX maintainer sitting in the back row, so he will tell me if we get anything wrong. Thank you, Matt, <laughs> um, What did I say? Um, oh, yeah, yes, yeah, machine description, yes, yeah. <laughs> and if you, depending, on, depending on your editor, you may get markdown mode set enabled rather than um, a, a scheme mode, which is what you really want. <laughs> yep. OK. Um, OK, so adding that line in there. OK. Ready to move on? So running configure. So GCC builds out of tree, you already all knew that. So let's make a peer to where we've checked out. We'll make it called BD, OK? Build directory, OK? So we have create that as a peer of your GCC repository checkout. And then we're going, we should be able to say configure. Our target is going to be VAM unknown elf. OK, unknown because we've not specified them. Um, we're going to have a prefix. We're going to install it in slash op slash. You can install it where you want to. That's your install prefix. OK, we're not going to worry about headers because this is a stage one compiler. We're only going to enable C and we're going to disable bootstrap. OK, so we want the plain C compiler at this stage. OK, um, but there are many more options, mostly to disable or enable features. Okay. There are a whole load of prerequisites. If you're running Linux, you should have 
brought, you should probably have installed the build essentials that will not include GMP, MPFR and MPC development files. So certainly on Ubuntu, you need those three extra ones as well. Okay. And I've given you a link there to the prerequisites um, file, which tells you absolutely everything you need on your system in order to be build GC. For, on a, certainly on a Linux system, most of those will just be there. Yep, that's a very good point. Yes, yeah, so if you, at the top level... So yeah. has the system installed the version of the libraries to all of, or if you run, if you build a computer, yeah. For yeah, so that's a very good point from a Mache there, that if, depending on how old your installation is, the, 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 the distribution versions may be too old. There is, a, at the top level of GCC, there's a directory called Contrib which is a selection of contributed scripts that do all sorts of useful things. There is a script in there that will download the source for all the things you need and build them from source so you've got up-to-date latest versions. Okay, so at this stage you've got configured and you can go make all GCC and then it will go along and it will complain, ah, no rule to make target vam.md, not a markdown file, but a machine description. So, not unreasonably, it's complaining, you've told me to make a GCC and you haven't given me a, 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 um, a machine description. So, this is going to be what we do, we let better start putting a machine description in. Okay, so, let's add in the missing files. Okay, okay, so what files we're going to do, so let's go into GCC config, we'll make a directory for VAM, so do go ahead and do that. And, oh, look, I've got .cc here. So I have caught up and I have caught up. You can, this is taken from real actually doing it as opposed to typing the slides, so it's great. Okay, so yeah, touch, vam, those, and just create those four files. Okay. So I'll give you a moment just to do that. Okay, so once you've created those, we've just got bare, we've just got empty files there, but it should not now not on here. So we go and run make all GCC and it baths because it's missing a variable and it says oh I can't find first pseudo register did you mean first virtual register which I do know about but you didn't okay so what we're going to need to do is we're going to have to put all sorts of things in vam.h a load of things so let's look what we put in there. first of all we put in some useful um, uh, uh, built-ins okay and there's something called built-in define, which is where you do um, some useful defines. So underscore, underscore, vam, underscore, vam. So these will appear as hash defines in your system. And you can assert CPU equals vam. You can assert built-in assert machine equals vam. So you're telling it what the compiler, what the CPU is, what the um, machine, what the machine is. This is, is in config, um, so GCC config vam vam.h. Okay. okay, so these are just standard things you need to put in there, and we'll go through these. I should say at the end, I will give you a pointer to the repository which has all this in, but it's a useful exercise to go through it if you can type fast enough to actually just try and um, get this put together. Yes. Why is there a the end cycle? The do while. There will be a lot of stuff which is because everyone else does this. And I. I um, it's a little bit of a valid meeting because it will be the staples and the semicolon of the. 
Diese Lebensleute fallen für die Zeugnisrechte von uns. Und der Verein ist dann auch semi-tolerant. Und dann ist es kind of two one zero that basically allows you to put um, multiple statements there. And then you have a semicolon is terminated with a line zero. Okay, so this is playing C, C, C++ syntax, just to make sure this is a valid statement, you can put a semicolon after. Yeah, yeah okay, so that's why this C syntax. And you will find, yes, question. Okay, I, I don't know, I was saying, I've, a lot of these things, you do it this way because someone else did it. You, on the whole, you don't write these things from scratch. You copy them from someone else. So yeah, you could probably you could do it with an if statement. I think the point is to make it in a in a scenario where, if you use this macro and put a semicolon after it, it will still be valid syntax. Okay, are we happy to move on. So, so what goes into the header file, target description, macros and functions? The easy approach is to copy this. I would recommend OR1K. So that's the open risk 1000. It's good, it's quite simple. Um, it, it's like an early MIPS architecture. It's very close to DLX, which is um, from the um, Dave Patterson and John Hennessy textbook. Okay, um, so it's good and simple. And Stafford Horn, who writes the Open Risk um, uh, backend, is actually very clear in his writing. It's very easy to understand. Um, I always would like to get Stafford along here, but he has a day job as a merchant banker in Japan, so he just does this as a hobby. Um, associated um, uh, implementation code goes in VAM.cc. Okay, and you can have data storage, data types, register model, ABI implementation. So we'll look at all of those. Okay, but I say take one, then copy one, and use it. Yes. Oh. Yes. Yeah, so this is .h file, but then we'll have we'll get onto the .ccc file. Okay, because you may in the .h file have stuff that needs implementation in the .cc file. So then there's a whole load of stuff, and I say you can. Don't just type it from the screen, copy this from O1K and then just change the values, okay? So, is, is sign char the default or not? Are your bits big endian, are your bytes big endian, are your words big endian? Um, how many bits per word, how many units per word, rather than bytes, because well, there might not be bytes. What's your pointer size, what's your biggest alignment, your strict, do you need strict alignment in various places? Where's your, what's your function boundary gotta be on? Whole load of these here. Okay. I have a question here, because I referenced uh, bits per unit yesterday, because it's in documentation, but it's not well defined what it means. Ah, right. Okay, so we need bits per unit as well. Because you've got bits per word and units per word, you ought to be able to derive that automatically. Yeah. Then the question is, what exactly does it mean? Right. Okay. Yeah. So if you're doing a Cray one, you may have issues here with yeah. bits per unit. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I won't put it in here because it probably doesn't apply to our example. But yeah. Uh, bits per unit of 64 bit bytes. Nope, not in there. Okay, and sizes of data types. So, all these different types here. And I think um, uh, the, 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 obviously, you've got to follow the C standard rules. So, um, types have to get no smaller as you go up them. And there's a minimum size for all the various types. 
Um, and I think, as we discussed earlier, when you start getting into exotic type sizes, then you might need to sort of look at what the code does to work out how to do it. And you need to define the binary interface. Okay, so for VAM, we've said R0 is tied to 0, R1's a stack pointer, R2's a frame pointer if you have one, R3's a, a function call return link, so when you do the branch and link, it'll be where you link back to. Um, we've got a series of arguments in R4 to R9. We've got um, nine scrap, uh, saved registers and uh, uh, 13, 12, 13 scratch registers. Um, and we have an extra R32 from our point of view, a 30, 33rd register, which is the status register, which has those four bits to tell you what the results were. Okay. And we'll define some register names. Okay. Notice that we don't define the program counter. The program counter is sort of known about. Okay, and we'll also note that which of these are fixed registers in the sense of what they do cannot be changed. Okay, so we've said the um, R zero is fixed because it is always zero. R one is always the stack pointer, so it's a fixed role, and uh, the status register is fixed. It's just the status register; you can't use it for anything else. Okay. Um, and this is register allocation order. And this is the order in which to use registers. Um, um, and the idea is to use the ones you're least likely to have to spill. Okay. Right. And so we've chose, chosen here. Okay. Um, then register classes, because, um, and here's where, okay, we define some sort of standard classes, no registers, um, um, general registers, flag registers, so that's our status register, all regs, which is all the registers, and lim reg classes is just in the enumeration, just to be the highest number. Okay, so it doesn't, okay. And there, yeah, okay, so the n reg classes bracket uh, in lim reg classes, okay. Um, and then we've got some names for these, which we can we can put on there. Okay, and we'll see where. They are. Um, now, now I've ah, my mind's gone blank. Reg class contents. These are yes. So yes. So these are this is um these are bit fields. Okay, we've got thirty three registers. Okay. Um, so, how do I tell which of my 33 registers belong in each of these classes? No regs, general regs, flag regs, all regs, okay? And what I do is I do bits. I set them to one if you're in this class. So, no regs, no bits set. All regs, oh, sorry, um, general regs, um, the first 32 bits, and the first 32 bits are on the left. Status register is register 33, so it's the first bit of the second word, okay, because these are 32-bit things. And then all reg is all the general reg plus a bit to set, say that. Okay, so this is a bit, this is a bit matter. We've got to do 64 bits because it's always multiple of 32. Okay, but we're actually only using 33 of them to say which one is there. Okay. And so uh Basically, we order these classes in the order of, of, of smallest first, okay, because reg no reg class says, given a register, which class are you in? And you look for the tightest class it could be in, okay? So you, if you're given a general register, return the general register class, not the all regs class, okay? And that's why we order them the way we do. Um, we've got very simple classes here called, that could obviously get arbitrarily complex. So, right, okay, we define a header, okay, may call GCC, spregnum wasn't set, hmm, hmm, the stack pointer register number wasn't set, so how do we set that? Well, we're not going to define it in the header, it's going to come out of the machine description, in fact, 
okay? Because the stack pointer is so important, the machine description needs to know about it. It's not enough just to be in a header. Okay? So now it's time to get into the machine description. As I say, code generation is generic. Um, GCC is a pattern matching compiler. Um, um, and we match these standard packet patterns generated from the front from the, the front part of the compiler and a template of how they're to be generated. Okay. Right. So we said that. Okay. And we talked about these before. We talked about the modes. We've talked about lowering. You can see there's um, with machine description. So let's have now. This is where we skipped over before because I wanted to do more detail here. Okay. So we've got the define inson, and we're defining one of the stand ones, add SI3. So that's a three operand. You know, two, ar two arguments, one result, adding SI, single integer, 32-bit integer add, okay? And um, that's saying, GCC, you can lower RTL using this predefined name. So when you come to come out of um, uh, the, the Gimple world, you can, you, you, you can generate, if you've got add, add SI3, you can match it using this, okay? Um, and we need to have patterns to say where it matches. So let's have a look at that a bit more. Okay. Let's look at the first one, the match operand SI0. Okay. So what this is saying, match operand, okay, um, is I want to be an operand. I want to be a single integer operand because this is adding single integers. Okay. And I'm going to call this operand 0. Okay. Because it's a, and that's going to be my destination, because that's the way I have it. Okay, so the first operand, okay. Um, the zero is just an identifier. I could actually put what I wanted in there, but it's used later. So what we want is RTL with matching a register operand, okay. And then we've said this operand is a register operand, okay. Okay, and it's saying, is a given candidate bit of RTL suitable for this, okay. And it's a gating function, it's allow or deny. Is this a register operand or is it not? Okay. And register operand is a predefined standard GCC predicate. We'll see later you can write and use your own C predicates there. Okay, but it's a stand one for saying this is something that's a register operand. So then we have a, a, a more detailed list of operand restraints. Okay. Now, unlike predicates, which is a can I use it, can't I use it? The register allocator will try to shuffle the RTL around to try and satisfy the constraints. Okay, and it expresses the exact semantics of your instruction operands. Okay, yeah. It's an addition. If you just go back up. It's add. So in the presentation here, this is add three operations, okay? The first operand is the destination. The second two operands are the two things to be added. I'll come to the, don't ignore that equal sign until I get to it. I will explain the equal sign in a moment. Okay, okay. right, okay, so I, I'm, I'm with you now. Um, yeah, the significance of the equals is to say these are operands to be written to. Okay, so that says, and you'll see there's two of them here, R comma R, both registers. Okay, so this says, this is a register operand, specifically a register operand to be written to. And I'll look at it, why do you tell me twice? It's a register operand to be written to, uh, or it's a register operand to be written to, because it's a comma separated list of alternatives. Okay, so, and the equals applies to all of them. It's not equals R comma equals R, it's equals, and then that applies to all the constraints. So let's now look at the whole thing here, and you'll see the second operand. It's a register operand, R comma R. The third, the, the, the operand number two, the third of the operands, is actually an arithmetic operand because it can be one of two possibilities. It can be R, and there's no equals of front, it's a, read, a readable register, or it can be a capital I. 
and it's an Arith operand. It's not a register operand, it's a general arithmetic operand. So it's not just a register, because I means constrained to be an immediate con constant. And something to understand is that you'll see that each operand has two alternatives, okay? And they match up. So you can have first choice, first choice, first choice, or second choice, second choice, second choice. You can't mix and match. You can't have first, second, first, okay? So think of them as a sort of set in a, almost lined up in columns. You can have equals R, 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 or you can have equals R, R, I, okay? Okay, so each operand has to have the same number of constraints. Okay, and just as you can write your own predicates, you can write your own constraints as well, and we might get to that later. Okay. So, um, the next operand, which is empty here, is a global predicate. If you look in the RIS-5 code, you'll see that quite a lot. It's used as a global predicate, say, is this a 64-bit or a 32-bit RIS-5 architecture? OK, and that's sort of like use a, a big sort of don't even bother with this one. It's, it don't even test the operands. Just this, this isn't relevant to you. OK. Um, and typically used to, as I said, they table the pattern. As I said, uh, empty just means true. This pattern is always used. OK. And then um, the code generation template. OK. Now, this is an example from risk 5 and actually it's just a C expression to say give me a string that represents the assembler and this says if you're 64 bit use add w otherwise use add okay and t0 t1 percent 0 percent 1 percent 2 those map to those labels you had before so um, if we look up here where was it here, you see there you've got match operand 0, match operand 1, match operand 2. Those are the percent 0, percent 1, percent 2. Those are the way you pick up those labels to say whatever it is you recognized, okay, and GCC understands, oh, if it's a register operand, this is how I'm going to turn it into something that means a register. So you can define your, again, you can define your own ones to do that, okay. I say this one says, it's a C expression, it says, it's either add w, because that's what you do to do it to a 32-bit operation. The 64-bit architecture is just plain add if it's a 32-bit architecture. Okay. And lastly, you can associate some attributes uh, with the pattern. Uh, mode is mandatory. I think it, um, it can be, if it can be automatically derived, you don't need to specify it. Everything else is optional. And basically, when you come to some specialist code generation functions, they can query attributes of, of the operations. We don't talk much more about attributes in this talk. So let's look at VAM.MD. OK. Well, first of all, we define some constants. And that's where SPRegnum gets defined. OK. Um, and these are ones that um, uh, are going to be useful, and I think the compiler knows about. I can't remember. Hey, oh, um, yeah, SP Regnum, the stack pointer, HFP Regnum, the hardware frame pointer, as in the, the hard number of the RAM, LR Regnum, the uh, link register, so the return addressed, RV Regnum, the return value, and SR Regnum, the status register. Okay. So let's look at some of these standard patterns. The first one's really easy. It's NOP. Okay. Um, and it's just an operand with constant int zero, okay? And it generates a NOP operation. That's the assembly operation. It's very, very simple. And we have, a no, we have, a, we have an explicit NOP operation in, in the VAM. So let's look at add SI3, okay? So um, VAM is a two address machine, okay? So it uses. When you do something like add, add x, y, it adds x to y and puts the result in x. Okay? So that makes things a little tricky. Okay? Um, so add si3, match operand si, well, that's the destination register, first operand. Match the second operand, that's the other thing we're going to add. Oh. Hold on, the third operand is really the first one we had of all. Okay? So that's easy. Operand 2. We just say zero. We say it's actually the same one as you had the first operand. So that's how I do a two address um, machine, okay? And then our, um, because of the syntax is 
so, sorry, so when I do, sorry, I should say VAM, add x, y, adds x to y and puts the result in y because it's the second one. So uh, add um, the second, the, 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 the one that's the, just the operand to the one that's both destination and source as the percent zero. Okay. And we can do the same with sub SI. You see, it looks very similar. So that's all very straightforward. You can add those in. Um, and there's a whole load of further reading, standard names. So in the internals manual, that's a subsection of the machine description thing. It'll tell you all the standard. As I say, one of the challenges is, and I have asked this question, and if anyone knows the answer, there isn't a minimal, what are the least set I need to implement to get a working compiler? Um, you certainly don't need all of them. And sometimes it's obvious you don't need them, but other times it's not. Okay. There's a section on generically on machine description, there's a section on the output statement, exactly how you can do the syntax of assembly code. Machine mode.def, all the definitions of the different machine modes, and look at Open One, Open RIS 1000. That's probably one of the simplest um, starting point architectures. Okay. So now um, you know, on time. Adding implementation detail, target specific uh, options. Okay, so this is the .opt file, um, and you might want specific options for your your architecture has a particular feature you want to be able to able, uh, enable from the command line and draw on in your machine description. So, VAM, uh, the divide and multiply operations are optional. So we're going to say hard div, you can generate a divide instruction. Soft div, you can't divide it. Hard mull, soft mull. And inside the .opt file, you can say, well, this is my option, m hard div. OK, target, reject, negative, inverse mask, soft div. So the, the flag is going to be called soft div. Hard, if you specify mouse to m hard div, it will invert that flag. And then there's a help file. OK, help, help description, OK? m soft div. Um, um, reject never now it's not inverse mask it's mask okay okay um, so a reject negative means you can't put no soft div okay it means you've got to have hard div if you want it because most most flags in GCC you can do M X or M no hyphen X to invert it but in this case we don't have we don't allow M minus no hard div okay in a turn don't we reach it okay the fault is minus M hard div okay so you had those and now you can compile with minus M hard div for this target, and it will set a flag that you can use. Okay. So, put it all together now, and we do make all, and almost everything happens. Okay. So, where it goes, and we get we get this stuff where it does gen emit. Okay. And ah, hmm. Yeah, this 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 blew up. Now, I think. This is Dave Malcolm's area of expertise, and and it was supposed to work. Um, and the interesting thing is, is it a problem in this part of the compiler called GenEmit? And the suggestion was try with a smaller number of partitions. Um, and then it did actually work. Okay, everything happens. And what you get out is in your build tree under GCC, you'll have a command called XGCC, and that is your compiler. So I created XGCC, I've built my GCC. Now, where we run into with this issue here is I then ran it, and I gave it some options to tell it where all the, to look up all the files, that's the minus B flag. Um, I told it was C language, I said no standard income, dev null. So I tried to compile dev null to, to assembler, Oh, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. Yes, this is yes. That's right. So I didn't run this. This comes out when you do everything happens. You get a GCC and it does a self test. Okay, and the self test is just to try and generate the assembler of assembling dev null. Okay, so it's nothing at all. Okay, and I got an internal compiler and an error in default legitimate address p at target hooks dot c. Okay, and it couldn't work out what to do in the compiler. Okay. Now, where are we here? Uh, yeah, so we have a second attempt, 
And I can't, I think. It's self test RTL dump test. It's trying to, uh, it's running a unit test of trying to dump RTL. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And um, so, yeah. And it says, please submit a full bug report because it all failed. Okay. Um, and I tried, um, so, so it sort of is getting there. It's saying, I've got a compiler, I've generated a compiler, but it doesn't pass its self-tests. Okay, so that's quite a good position to be in. We've created a compiler, but it then blew up again. And the reason for that is, um, you're not allowed to do a new backend without actually documenting it. So I had to add a bit of documentation. So I just fixed the, um, uh, so if you fix the manual, that problem, I think, uh, I think this is complaining here that it was having a bit of a problem with the manual, okay? Yes. All right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So the self test is fine, but we've basically got a GCC. It's just it's not working. Okay. And so, and this is where I'm going to repeat what David says here because I've I haven't he did tell me how to improve this slide and I forgot to put it on here, um, which is let's compile stuff to try and dump what's going on, okay? Um, we can debug using the minus wrapper option, okay? So if I do gcc minus wrapper gdb hyphen args minus v minus o hello hello dot c, um, it will go and fire up v is giving you all the verbose options and I should have dropped me, did I not? And then it should have automatically generated that. Because that's what I hope would auto. I think that I've shown it as a command, but I think that should be. Yes, what have I got? Did I, did I miss a command? Did I miss an option to GDB? Yes. And it's that that you want to debug. Oh, sorry. That, and it's that you want to debug. So the idea is GCC is a wrapper. I'm just repeating for the, the go. And actually, what we want to do here is to get to CC1, which is the which is the actual compiler that we've created, and debug that. And there's two ways to do it. If you can either have a pre-debugging on previous slides. Um, yeah. Um, so you could pass in the actual wrapper and then the end of the subprocess invoked by the driver. Yeah. Yeah. And the reason I've put minus v is because it should give us exactly what the command is that it's using yeah. all the way through. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So this is the thing we want to debug. CC1, the actual compiler itself. Okay, and so that, yeah. It, David, go for it. Well, well, tell me what the problem is. No, no, no let's have it for the record because it'll save me.
testimony mark fail, and it is like a file and it's trying to find that part. Excel is self testing self instead of test. And I think what you uh, oh no I can't remember, sorry. Um uh, the 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 self test basically it the argument is here's a part of the low resource <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, th I suspect I stopped there. Let's go right back and find out. So, ah, uh, right. Okay. So here's a suggestion from Mache right at the beginning. There we are. Yeah, so the suggestion is that possibly doing dot dot slash gcc slash configure may be the cause of the problem of that error, and we should have used an absolute address for configure might make a go. Anyway, so let's just go back to where we got to. Where we've got to at the moment is we have successfully... We have successfully created a GCC, not a working GCC, but we have created a GCC. It fails its very basic. End. And almost certainly that's because I don't have um, the machine description fully complete. I haven't put enough of the necessary functions in there. It's David. Yeah, so first, okay. Okay, that's a, that's a very good point. So Dave points out that the, the, the test framework is such that you know, the first test that fails, we give up. And initially, you may want to just get, you know, hash if def out that test uh, to just try and get everything through. So let's just summarize where we've got to because we're getting towards the end of our time. We've created a minimal vam.cc to define and initialize the target. We've hand created vam.op.urls, um, uh, which is briefly one of the fixes I did. Okay, and That might be a bug because that should be automatically generated. Um, we've created the vam common.ccc um, and Oh, so this is what else I did. So these are things we did. So we've created a minimal vam.cc. Yeah, David? Okay, so after the recall, there's a, there's a Python script that sets this up, but you have to hand hack it to put your new target in there. Yeah, yeah. Okay, fine. So I just hacked it by hand, but yeah, okay. We created some common, VAM common stuff using a template in a parent. So these are the extra things I haven't covered in the talk. I added VAM to invoke.techi for the user manual, and I configured with minus enable maintainer mode to regenerate some of the files. So those aren't covered in the talk, but those are just for the record, some extra things that I had to do. Okay, But we know how to fix the second one of those. So what next? Okay. Um, so I talk, this is part of our three-month graduate training course. This section's given over about five days, and I've distilled it into 120 minutes. 
One day, I'll create a full public tutorial, and this is part of the exercise. Each year, I do another tutorial, and I try and make it better, but probably won't finish till I retire. In the meantime, everything I've got so far is in GCC-VAM. Um, please look at it. Please comment it. You can raise issues and say, your tutorial course will be a whole load better if you can send me um, uh, patches okay, to say, here is a patch to fix your tutorial. This is what you're missing. All of those will be good. Um, I have, I, I'm, if anyone wants the source for my slides, just email me and I'll give them to you. They're in uh, LibreOffice, um, so it's not easy just to put, because that's, that's not an easy text representation to put on a, a repository, okay? Uh, but anyone can have them if they want to. Um, and uh, yeah, so really what I'm looking forward now is have a go at this. Make it, hopefully it's given you the starting points to get going on this. Great, thank you very much, David, for sort of adding bits as we've gone along, that, the bits that I didn't quite understand. As I said at the beginning, copy someone else's and refine it to your purposes. Don't, trying to do this from scratch is really hard, okay? But it does mean you get bits like the while loop where, well, I just did it because that's what everyone else did and they didn't really think why it mattered, we now know. Okay, so um, take that away, and yeah, thank you very much. Any questions? Yes? Please explain a little bit why a bit of inverse and disable bootstrap option is needed for one of the users. Uh, so, it's only part of the application. It's only part of the application that we do have, but uh, bootstrap means that the compiler builds itself, and then that build compiler is used to build itself again and compare the results as a static trick. Yeah, so the so we we at this stage eventually you should get into a stage where hopefully you can bootstrap. You've got to be careful with bootstrap on a cross compiler because you're looking at where you run what and so forth, because you're looking at compiling for the target and then running on the target. So depending on your target, it's not even possible to bootstrap onto a, a cross compiler. Dis with, was it disable headers without headers? Yeah, so uh, So typically if you're doing a Linux compiler tool chain, you'll pull those headers out of the Linux you'll have a Linux source tree and you'll pull those headers out of the Linux source tree. At this stage for an embedded target, we don't need to worry about those. And we can just have, I think, on a second iteration, we'd have enough information there. We could just get bare metal headers out of the ELF stuff. So, so you would typically do stage one compilation, just do C, no headers. You'd then generate all the other bits. Then you'd use that to create your libraries. So you'd compile new lib. That will give you some headers. And then you could do with headers and pull the new pull headers. And in fact, one of the options for configuring is you actually tell it, I've com I'm going to build with new lib, and it will know about the new lib structure and how to pull things out. And you can do the same with glibc and Linux headers. So, yeah. Now, good questions. Anything else? OK. Well, enjoy that. Um, any suggestions? Just please raise issues on the repository and you know feedback, how I can make this better. And hopefully, come back next year with more tutorials. Maybe it's David's turn next year to tell us how to do the middle end. Um, but the goal is, over time, to create a set of materials that makes it easier for new participants to join in with the GCC community. Okay? Okay, thank you very much.